Hi, I'm Mark Polymeropoulos, host of the Above Average Intelligence podcast here on the DSR Network. Every Monday, I speak with journalists, authors, and of course, actual former intelligence officers, spies like myself, for a look at current events from the perspective of the intelligence community. If that sounds good to you, then please consider becoming a member of the DSR Network. Members of the DSR Network gain access to exclusive content, access to the DSR Slack and Discord communities, expanded show notes for select episodes, and more. All of this for just $7 a month or $70 for a year. As a thank you for listening, I'm offering 25% off the regular membership price. Please visit the dsrnetwork.com slash buy and enter code Intel. That's the dsrnetwork.com slash buy and code Intel. This is Above Average Intelligence, a production of the DSR Network. Each week, hosts Mark Polymeropoulos and David Rothkoff are joined by leading experts from the intelligence community for expert analysis on the biggest security challenges around the world. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Mark Polymeropoulos, and this is DSR's Above Average Intelligence Show. Today, I'm very happy to welcome as my guest, Mr. Louis Sage Passant. And I think I said this correctly, as only a, uh, a Greek American can, a little bit different than French. But uh, he's a researcher in the field of intelligence and espionage, specializing in the private sector and how corporations use intelligence to navigate geopolitical and security risks. Louis is a former British military intelligence officer. He holds a PhD in intelligence studies. He serves as global head of intelligence for a major private sector firm, and he's also an adjunct professor teaching intelligence at uh, uh, I'm going to get this wrong again, Sciences Po or Sciences Po in Paris. Uh, actually, I said this, Louis, uh, to my mother-in-law who uh, who speaks native French, and I got yelled at for my pronunciation. Um, but he has experience working and living in the Middle East and Asia Pacific regions in a variety of geopolitical analysis and intelligence roles, supporting the energy industry, financial sector, and leading technology firms. He has appeared in numerous media outlets um, across the globe. And, uh, we actually have had a couple of fun interactions. I think, uh, I did a guest lecture with your class in Paris, which was awesome. Um, on your podcast too, where we talked about recruitment operations. So this is a perfect way to continue our collaboration. Although I do expect an invitation to Paris at some time soon, but, uh, but Lewis, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me, Mark. I hope you like that kind of giant uh, introduction. And I've managed to mispronounce just about, uh, just about everything again on my mother-in-law. Um, yelled at me because I was very excited. I did a guest lecture for one of the premier, you know, universities in Europe, and I then I destroyed the, the the name. But that was actually a really fun time. I think the students enjoyed it, and I was, you know, in one of my kind of not so rare forms of uh, just being kind of very blunt um, uh, about the world and about the the intelligence business. The the students definitely enjoyed it. I, uh, I I sat them down at the end of semester to kind of get feedback on what worked, what didn't work, what they wanted to spend more time on, and. Uh, overwhelmingly, the feedback I got was guest lectures are excellent because I, the, the course is supposed to give them this view of the public sector and the private sector of intelligence. So I really tried to get an array of guests such as yourselves to come in and, and, and talk about both sides of the coin there. And I think they, they benefit a lot from it. So let's uh, let's jump in. You know, we're going to do a couple of things today. Um, we're going to talk about some of your expertise uh, uh, as well. And we'll, well, at the end of the show, we'll talk about Generation Z. It's one of my favorite subjects. And I think you're a perfect person um, to, uh, uh, to discuss kind of the, you know, the, the, maybe not the conflict, but the tensions between generation Z and, and people like me, or maybe like you, I think you're maybe a little younger than me, but, um, but, but anyhow, but let's, uh, what we do uh, on this show is we start off on current events. Um, and I think it's going to be interesting to see, hear your perspective, um, you know, particularly on Ukraine, let's start off there, uh, and think about it from your kind of your former, uh, your role as a, as a former British military intelligence officer, also your current role. But really, I think, uh, you know, the audience here would benefit from, you know, the European perspective on Ukraine. And and, you know, uh, uh, this show can get a little political, so don't 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 be shy. But, you know, a lot of worries and concerns in Europe about, you know, what is kind of the U.S. role in the world now? Um, is is the U.S. going to be a reliable ally? Uh, I think we you know, I don't I don't want to get too hyperbolic, but I think that U.S. the vote in the Congress uh, several weeks ago that authorized that, you know, 60 billion dollar package for Ukraine. That was an extraordinary moment, and I think probably a lot of people breathed a sigh of relief. But uh, but give us your perspective from from across the pond on on you know the role of the United States now, um, 2024 uh, uh, and beyond, and particularly in Ukraine. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I think you're spot on there. I think we we certainly 
breathed a, a sigh of relief there. Um, at the same time, I think it's been a bit of a wake up moment for Europe. You know, I think we're we're realizing we're seeing this with President Macron's recent comments here in Europe. He did a phenomenal uh, interview with the Economist newspaper um, a, a week or so ago, talking about this. Um, you know, that Europe needs to be able to stand on its own two feet. Of course, you know, we we hope that our American allies, who, who have long provided the cornerstone of European defence, will stick around. Uh, that the alliance will remain strong. You know, being a, a, a former former NATO soldier myself, you know, I, I certainly subscribe to that Atlanticist view. Being a European, I have to say, you know, we are starting to get nervous. We're hearing some of the comments coming out of Washington. We're seeing a more isolationist tone. And I think it's lead, leading many of us in Europe to start questioning why we've gotten so lax on this, especially when we've got, you know, not, not one, but two major wars going on in the world. One of them, you know, pretty much in our backyard. And we're seeing the impact of that. We've been through the energy crisis. We're seeing, you know, just this week talk of sabotage and, uh, you know, hostile intelligence operations taking place on European soil, which I think is sending a very clear signal that that we have to be ready to stand on our own two feet here. So I think a, a sigh of relief, we're, we're hoping for the best, but, you know, I, I also hope we're starting to plan for the worst. I think you made a great point on on uh, French President Macron and, and kind of his recent comments. I thought that Economist article, and, and you know, incidentally, that's something that I think a lot of us, you know, uh, here in the United States, religiously read, um, but but you know his comments were pretty extraordinary because one of the things that that seems evident to me, and and this evolves over the last several years of the war, is that that many of our European allies, meaning the U.S. The Americans, European allies, seem less um, risk averse than the United States. I mean, you know, Macron was very aggressive in some of his comments, and um, and you look at you know it, it, look at the U.K. as well. There was really you know across their political aisle bipartisan support. For for Ukraine, you have the, the worst kept secret in the intelligence business is that British SOF, uh, Special Operations Forces, are extremely aggressive and active in, in Ukraine. So why is it or how has this changed where all of a sudden the Americans are the ones who are kind of, you know, you were, um, you know, we're, we're doing our uh, our hand wringing about, you know, escalation with Russia. But it, it, as far as, as, as Europe goes, um, seems like the opposite. I, by the way, I think that's a very good thing. But it, but it is curious to see how this has changed over the last, what, two years. I think it, it goes back a little bit longer than that. You know, I think we we in Europe have borne the brunt of some of some of Russia's, you know, what we call liminal warfare operations. We've seen weapons of mass destruction used on British soil in the, the Skripalma uh, assassination attempt. You know, we've seen, um, you know, sabotage against European infrastructure. So I think think a lot of us are sitting here going well we're bearing the brunt of this now this is real it's no longer a theoretical exercise and i think that's what we're seeing play out that macron i think he he explained that very well where he said you know we're fighting a kind of hybrid warfare actor every time we set down a red line it just gives them rules that they can play with it gives them an area that we say okay you can go up to this point and we won't respond and that's not helpful all that's doing is giving them room to maneuver so this approach of strategic ambiguity saying you know maybe we'll put troops in ukraine you know, you won't know until you find out. Um, you know that that's a, a, quite a new way of thinking, but I think it's quite a, a useful one. I think the problem is we need to see the investment to back up the words. You know, we need to see the the mobilization of of industry. We need to be able to stand on our own two feet truly if we're going to act in, in such a such a risky way. No, I, I I hear you on that too, and and again, I think that's you know that that of course has seems to have evolved as well. The conventional thinking. Maybe the conventional is the wrong word, but some of the thinking amongst the foreign policy establishment here is that, you know, this $60 billion aid package will help Ukraine get through the next year. But then Europe um, uh, and, and by the way, the European commitment to Ukraine has been rather extraordinary. In fact, as the Europeans, you know, opposite to what former President Trump actually says, uh, the Europeans have spent more on Ukraine than the United States have. But but that kind of assistance kicks in maybe in 2025 and beyond. So I think there's there's a there's there's certainly some hope. One thing that we've seen in the intelligence world, and there's been some really incredible reporting. There's a there's that you know a, a uh, uh, investigative journal, The Insider, uh, run by some friends of mine, Michael Weiss and Christo Gazrev, and they have reported on really kind of Russian dirty tricks uh, in Europe. The only you know not only current but over the past several years, uh, in the sense of sabotage operations, assassinations, um, and it seems to me this has, and maybe I'm exaggerating things a bit, but it's it's opened the eyes to a lot of people uh, uh, where you are, and in particular, as as kind of kicked the kicked into overdrive some of the investigations um, of Russian penetrations, whether whether it's you know uh, intelligence penetrations in Germany or or in other places. What are, what are your thoughts on that, and have you followed that reporting? 
I have. I've been following that one very closely. You know, for, for us in the private sector, this is an area we're watching very, very closely. Um, you know, a lot of this infrastructure is privately owned. Um, we do not benefit of the sa- from the same level of security as, as many kind of state critical infrastructure assets. Um, so we recognize we're both a soft target. We're also an enticing one because, you know, hey, if you blow up an airfield, you're going to get a military response. If you blow up some privately owned infrastructure, maybe, maybe not. And, and that introduced risks. So, you know, I think we, we recognize there is a serious risk here. Um, I think part of what we're seeing as well is, you know, there is a growing awareness of the influence into political life here in Europe. And I think that's to your previous question as to why we're starting to see sort of riskier approaches and more, more punchy approaches. I think it's driven by that. You know, I think people like Macron are realizing they have to force the the kind of more extreme political parties in France to take a vocal position on Russia. Uh, and by taking a kind of aggressive position himself, it forces them to to either criticize him or, or kind of facilitate it, uh, which makes their politics a bit more visible. And I think domestically, that's quite useful because it allows him to point to, to, to these political parties and say, you know, look, they're supporting Russia. If you vote for them, it's not it's not just a vote against me, which is a very French thing. You know, voting against the president is kind of a national sport. Um, but you're basically saying you're, you're also voting against Ukrainian security and by extension, European security. Um, so I think, um, you know, I think there's a, a few reasons we're seeing this, but yeah, this is certainly something we're all watching very closely over here. You know, one of the, one of the reactions is funny. A, a friend of mine said, you know, this is after kind of Macron, you know, made some really tough statements and the economist interview is, Hey, you know, I don't know where this came from, but you know, I love it. <laughs> so, you know, we are, we're good with it. And then, you know, you go back to, you know, France is a, is, a, has been a staunch ally of the United States. Remember the first state dinner that president Biden had was with, uh, with, uh, with Macron. Uh, as well. So I think a lot of that is welcome. Now, of course, um, and we're going to diverge here a little bit, you know, I think uh, uh, the, uh, the the French views on China might diverge a little bit from the United States, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take uh, we'll take the aggressive posture on Ukraine anytime. Let's let's switch a little bit um, to what I really wanted to talk to you about um, uh, today, which is which is what your work in the private sector is all about. Is all about. Um, and your main topics of work these days are corporations approach Um, to the increasingly complex geopolitical landscape and the foreign industrial espionage threat and how to fight it. So let's let's talk about uh, this a little bit from, you know, what's your perspective um, from a private sector uh, uh, viewpoint of uh, of espionage these days? It's a a huge topic these days. This is this is really a a, a focus and a passion of mine. I, I did my thesis on this topic, kind of looking at what intelligence looks like in the private sector and you know what? What I'm finding is, while it's nothing new, um, corporations have been doing intelligence for quite literally centuries. In fact, the the first example I could find of a, a kind of corporate intelligence department predates any of the modern continuously existing intelligence services. It predates MI6 by uh, quite literally decades. Um, you know, even the Office of Naval Intelligence in the U.S., which I've recently been corrected and told is the uh, oldest uh, oldest American intelligence service. Um, was even predated by by this private company, Lloyd's of London, the insurers, and, and their uh, their Lloyd's agency, their intelligence team. There's examples going back even further, kind of the East India Company having a, a secretary for uh, secret state and diplomatic affairs, kind of looking at geopolitics of the regions they operated in. So it's nothing new, but what is particularly interesting is right now is the scale of it. These historical examples I found were really oddities. It was companies that were so exposed to risk. They were operating in such kind of uh, geopolitically risky parts of the world that they had no choice but to do intelligence. And then what we've seen in recent decades, you know, starting in about the 70s and 80s, the oil industry in particular started standardizing this idea of having intelligence functions because they were operating in very complex places, especially in 1970s and 80s. You think about the context of, of the Gulf states and the, the, the conflicts there. And uh, my colleague in the uh, in, in the research field, uh, Dr. Maria Robson Morrow at Harvard, she's done some phenomenal work looking into this uh, and how it became kind of standardized. Then what we've seen in recent decades, especially post 9-11, is it, it's not just energy companies and banks and companies that are operating all around the world. It's starting to become everyone. And I would say post kind of COVID, Ukraine, and now the crisis in the Middle East, I think we're seeing it become truly standard. I've, I've never seen so many job postings on LinkedIn uh, for this field. And something I often point out to my students is, you know, every time you see 
a ship get targeted in the Red Sea, every time you see some sort of crisis, there's probably a new posting on LinkedIn appearing the very next day as a result of that. Because every time a corporation suffers one of these crisis incidents, someone sits down and says, you know, we really need to get better at understanding the world. We need intelligence to help us navigate these things. So it's nothing new, but it's really accelerating right now. And then I think if you zoom out and look at the wider geopolitical context, I think you've got two things happening at once. They're all part of this kind of great power competition we we see resurging. We've had 30 relatively calm, peaceful years from a corporate perspective. You know, the global war on terror, of course, you massive destruction across the world, but it wasn't really an existential threat to companies. It wasn't really stopping them from having access to, to any but the most severe markets. What we're seeing in recent years now is that great power competition is coming back and it's it's kind of reversing that trend. It's meaning some markets are completely off the table. Some places are just becoming completely inoperable for companies. Uh, and then on top of that, these governments are starting to look at the economy and say, hey, some of these critical technologies we need to be able to make ourselves. It's not comfortable for us that a foreign government or a foreign company makes these things. We need them produced locally so that if there's a conflict and sanctions, blockades, we're going to be okay. We can still produce these things ourselves. So I think companies are kind of finding themselves caught between these very tangible tactical effects. You know, uh, the Red Sea crisis is blockading ships, snarling up supply chains. You're seeing very clear costs associated with that. And then the other hand, at the other end, this more theoretical threat. Um, and I say theoretical in, in kind of quotation marks there because it's, it is very tangible. You know, we're seeing clear evidence of this. But this theoretical threat from corporate espionage, where an economic espionage where both rival corporations in some cases, but more often than not, state-sponsored actors are looking to kind of take technology uh, and bring it to their own markets. So I think companies are seeing these things and they're turning to intelligence as a, as a tradecraft and saying, how, how can we use this to help navigate these problems? Yeah, you can, you can make an argument that kind of the era of globalization, even hyper-globalization makes this intelligence field even more important. Um, billions of dollars that are at stake, not only for a company, but then it's the national security interests of a of a of a, of a, of a, of a state as well. With, as you said, kind of you know critical critical infrastructure. One thing I'm curious about, um, you know, I, so I think about my former career uh, uh, in, in the intelligence um, services, and so who would I report to as a you know if I'm if I'm in the field, uh, you know, uh, managing a CIA station? Obviously, I report back to headquarters. If I'm at headquarters, I'll go down to the National Security Council. Um, Give us a sense, though, what you know. If someone in the in the in the corporate um, intelligence world, are you are you in the C suite? Are you talking? You know, who is your point of contact? Is it are you the right hand man or woman to the CEO? You know, because this is this is no longer, hey, we're going to call up Lewis because our executives are going to travel to Colombia. I mean, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about you know investments putting billions at stake. And so, who is your you know give it you know who is your who is your point of contact in the company? Um, how much influence do you have? That's a really good question. Um, it's one that I, I looked at in my thesis. I, I interviewed about 60 of the world's largest companies, Intel teams, and, and tried to figure out how they do it. And this was precisely kind of one of the questions I looked at. And what I found was there's no two answers were the same. In some companies, it's, you know, we have direct access to the C-suite. We're their people. When they have a complex issue, they need to know about, you know, we're going to build a new factory in country X, or even to use your example, you know, the CEO is traveling to this kind of dangerous place in the world. What do we need to know? Both from a physical security perspective, but also from a, you know, is the hotel room going to be bugged? Can they use their telephone while they're there? You know, those kind of things. And in some companies, that's what it looks like. In many, uh, it's very different and the Intel teams find themselves kind of buried away. The most common answer I found, the most common structure is that they're part of the corporate security team. Um, by corporate security, I'm talking about physical security. Cyber security teams do often have uh, very sophisticated intelligence capabilities of their own, but very much focused on cyber threats. Um, confusing the matter, some have hybrid models where the two teams work together, others they're very separate. Uh, in some cases, you know, the cyber team also does kind of geopolitical risk. In other, to, in other places, that's more kind of in the realm of physical security. There's no real set model for this. What I found most broadly is the customers can be a mix and it's really all about what you're trying to achieve. The thing that I always caution my students is, you know, if you're briefing, um, you know, you're in the CIA, you're briefing uh, kind of your leadership, the president, whoever it is, that's someone who's probably trained and very used to receiving intelligence. You know, they have a long history of receiving it. In the private sector, that may not be the case. In fact, more often than not, the first 15 minutes of any conversation are, 
here's what I do. Here's what my job is. No, I'm not James Bond. My job's more about explaining the world. Um, you know, we don't have a license to kill. What we do is we help you analyze these risks and just explain the basics of what intelligence is. Now, depending on the company, you can get different levels of maturity. I've been really lucky in the, the places I've worked, I found a really high level of maturity. People get this stuff. They understand it. They understand how it impacts what they do. That's not always the case. You know, there are companies out there where I think there's a bit more of a fight to show the value intelligence adds and, and people don't quite get it you know they're very focused on their own areas and, and they don't really see what this has to do with them so sometimes you've got to really explain it to them um same goes with kind of what you're telling them you know sometimes you will get very clear kind of pull requests from your direction they'll say hey i need to know about this country we're going to build a factory here we need to know you know what the political landscape looks like for the next 10 years or we need to know you know we've been approached by this individual to do a business deal we need to understand are they are they sketchy have they been involved in something dodgy or, or can we can we trust them are they honest can we work with them um on the other hand often it's more push intelligence where you're seeing stuff and you're, you're seeing okay you know this situation here looks quite bad and i don't think anyone's figured out how it's going to impact the company you know we're seeing a crisis a flare up in the middle east people see this as maybe a local security issue they don't quite understand that if it spreads to say the red sea or the suez canal wherever it is we might see supply chain disruptions so it's about going to people who may not even know you exist and saying you know hey i'm lewis uh, i just need you to know about this this crisis that's going on and how i think it might impact your your business unit so it could be the full range from very kind of functional people buried away in the hierarchy but who who are really getting the stuff done all the way up to C-suites who are looking at making big strategic investment decisions. It, it really depends on the company and, and what you're trying to achieve, but there's absolutely no model to doing it, which uh, does make it quite interesting, I think. So, so, so two kind of reactions to this. One is, I guess, I, I, one of my you know, one of my contentions would be that, uh, especially for, for you know, major, major, let's say, Fortune 500 companies, big multinational companies, and I'm thinking of this as my former role as, a, as an intelligence officer, it's actually probably extraordinary the amount of access the C-suite would have to places of interest. So if you're sitting there and, in, you know, if I was sitting in a, at a, in a, as, a, as a private sector uh, 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 intelligence um, professional now, you know, I wonder if I would be thinking back to my old life saying, you know, holy cow, how, how does this person get access to individuals we never did um, before? That's a whole separate issue. But, but, but here's, here's a key question. Because always my contention and one of the problems in the U.S. Uh, intelligence community is there is for a variety of reasons, but there's a lack of accountability. Um, you know, things go wrong, whether it's 9-11, whether it's, let's see what happened in Israel, uh, the failure to um, uh, uh, detect and, and obviously prevent October 7th. Um, accountability is not always the hallmark of, of, of what occurs. Now, what about in the private sector when billions are on the line? Will, you know... Uh, uh, you know, will there be accountability for the intelligence professional in, in the private sector if something goes wrong? How have you seen that uh, evolve over time? It's a really interesting question. I think there's accountability when it goes wrong, but also account accountability when it goes right in the private sector, which is to say there's no evergreen assumption of relevance. Um, you know, I'm aware of one country, which I believe is Belgium, which got rid of its intelligence services for a few years and then reinstated it, realizing, you know, that wasn't a great idea right after the Cold War. You know, even if the CIA gets it really wrong, it would be very hard for the president to justify, you know, shuttering them. In the private sector, you've got to show your relevance. You've got to fight for that budget pretty much every single day. And it's a bit of a perverse problem. I, I often refer to it as the ECM problem. So when I was a, an, an infantry officer uh, out in Afghanistan, I used to carry the, the electronic countermeasure suite, which is this really heavy backpack that jams, you know, IEDs and things like that. And all you know about this thing is it weighs a ton. It gets really hot, which, you know, in the Afghan summer is not the ideal thing to have on your back. And it never, you know, it never beeps at you and says, hey, I just saved your life. You're welcome. You you never know how many times it saved your life, whether it's working or not. And I often liken intelligence to that, that what happens is if you're doing your job well and the number of security incidents faced by a company goes down, eventually someone's going to go, why are we spending all this money on security when we don't have any security incidents? So it, it can be a little bit tricky in that sense. The other side of it is that you're facing competition. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, different groups that are able to provide geopolitical insight. 
Um, you know, in most companies, what you find is internally, you've got several places that can provide this insight. You've got departments like government affairs, which would be our equivalent of the State Department. These are our diplomatic core. And they spend a lot of time talking to governments and they can give us really good insights on the government view. Now, in a functional relationship, which again, most of the companies I've worked in, I've seen this in action, which is a really good thing. The government affairs teams end up being your closest partners that, that you find that you're able to complement each other really well, much like State Department intelligence community. They provide their perspective. You provide yours, often kind of filling each, in each other's blanks. In other companies, it can get a little bit dysfunctional. Those t- teams don't necessarily know how to cooperate with each other. They don't fully understand each other because I think a lot of people have this perception of corporate security as you know the folks who run the guards, gates, and guns. They don't necessarily know they have the ability to do some pretty sophisticated intelligence stuff to, to weigh in on pretty sophisticated global issues. So they don't necessarily know they should be speaking to them. And then there's things like competition for budgets. The other competition comes from outside, and I'm, I'm really seeing this a lot right now in that there is a gold rush in the field because all of these companies have suddenly started really paying attention to geopolitics. Um, you know, This year's World Economic Forum in Davos, geopolitics was the big topic there. A number of CEOs were there talking about how, how much this is worrying them. We're seeing all of these advisory companies, consultants kind of popping up, offering geopolitical advice. Now, some of them have been doing this for decades. They've got tons of experience. Many of them have really impressive rosters of of really capable people, often really big name, kind of former intelligence leaders, former ambassadors and so on. And I think a lot of these companies, while they can provide good insights, they're only part of the puzzle. They don't necessarily understand how the private sector works. And in particular, they don't understand how your specific company works. They can give you this phenomenal view of how they see the world. But what they can't say is to say, you know, um, you know, I don't know, let's say uh, above average industries uh, has set up a new factory somewhere. We're suddenly really worried about geopolitics. And this company comes in, they sit down with the CEO, Mark, and they say, you know, look, here's our view of this country. Here's our view of the government. We've dealt with them for the years. This is what we think is going to happen next. That's a really useful view, but it's only half the equation. What really is valuable to you as the CEO is what's the contact surface between that problem and that description of events and my company? You know, where does it start to jam up the gears of of good business for us? And I think that's where the in-house people have an edge in that we're able to know the company really intimately. We're able to look at these external issues and say, okay, here's precisely where that's going to cause a problem for us. I think the problem is that a lot of senior leaders don't necessarily know that. They don't really, you know, they may not be aware they have this internal intelligence capability or they may just get wowed by the the big flashy titles of some of the folks that are coming in from outside to talk to them. Uh, some of these companies um, actually specifically will not work with internal intelligence teams. Uh, they prefer to go straight to the C-suite. I think one, because they can probably charge more. Two, you know, maybe there's a suspicion that if they work with the in-house folks, they may not impress them as easily. Um, you know, so I think that the way it should be working is that they work together. They both both of these groups are able to provide some really good insights that put the whole puzzle together and help the C-suite kind of navigate the problem. I think the problem is when there's so much money on the table, there's a bit of a gold rush. Everyone's just trying to cash in as quickly as possible. So right now it's a very messy landscape and there's a lot of competition out there. So I'm constantly urging practitioners in the field to to really be making sure that they're promoting what they do, that people understand they're not just guards, gates and guns, that they're able to weigh in on this kind of stuff because not everyone understands it. You know, it's rare for a president to not understand the value the CIA can bring. It's unusual for a C-suite to recognize what their Intel team can do because they've got so many other things to think about all day long, um, you know, and and we're not necessarily something they've got much uh, history of dealing with. Let me ask a, a quick question because now I think about kind of analytic methodology and, and one of the one of the, I think the misnomers that you see in you know particularly in the media is that the CIA is predictive on uh, on things. So for example, you know, um, uh, and, and you know, it, it's never a good idea to say things such as um, Russia is going to take Kiev in seventy two hours <laughs> because it might not occur. Instead, the the way intelligence services when when things are working correctly, they will give scenarios. You know, if this happens, X, Y, Z, if this happens. And so, you know, so you're not you're not actually predicting the future. You're just giving, you know, certain scenarios. Does that does that same type of kind of thinking exist in the in the private sector uh, world as well? 
It does. Um, I mean, I often tell my students, you know, that it, it's almost like predicting the weather. If I tell you there's a 70% chance of rain tomorrow, I'm also telling you there's a 30% chance of something else. And sometimes my students kind of go, oh, that, that's great because it just means you can never be wrong. And that's not at all the case. Our job is to try and get those risk probabilities right. Not to tell you which one it 100% is going to be, but to say, here's where we think the balance of risk lies. And exactly as you say, to try and promote these scenarios to say, okay, you know, think about your part of the business. Let's say you're the head of logistics for for above average industries. Okay, you know, we see this crisis brewing in the Red Sea. Precisely what would this mean for you if it carried on for another month? What about if it carried on for another six months? What if it carried on for a year? Or what if it was over to, to tomorrow? Are there any kind of no regret actions we could be taking right now to ensure that there's flow of goods uh, regardless of the outcome? And then let's start investing in what we think are the most likely outcomes. So I think that's that's the ideal way it should happen. There's one area that I think can be a little bit risky in this field is because you're dealing with consumers that, like I say, they don't have a great education of what intelligence is. Uh, I'm currently working on a, a, a kind of book on the field along with uh, Maria Robson Morrow and Angela Lewis, um, who are two other phenomenal scholars in this field. And our first chapter is called Leaving the Spook Behind. And it's essentially a kind of what to do if you're leaving a government agency coming into the private sector one of the key messages we're pushing is to say, don't be tempted to play the James Bond spy game, to dive into the mystique, because you'll have an audience that's very receptive to it, but you're doing them a huge disservice by giving them this idea that that you've got access to, you know, these secret sources and and you know this this highly accurate predictive mechanism that can tell them the future. Because all you're doing is mis-selling yourself, you're mis-selling what you're able to do, and you're probably leading them down the wrong path. It's far better to come in, speak the language of business. And go that scenario route, make it really clear to them that you can't see the future, but what you can do is help them kind of game out some potential futures and and what it might mean for them. So, you know, that's, I would say how most people are doing it, but there is always that temptation that worries me to, that people will come in and kind of lean into the mystique a little bit. It's funny you say that, Lewis, because, you know, I have to practice what I, what I preach. I've been, you know, going on MSNBC and giving my analysis on events in the Middle East. That's where I, I spent most of my career. And I've, and I've not taken my own advice i've actually you know in the last several weeks i think i've predicted the whole hostage deal um uh whether it's going to succeed or not i've gotten it wrong every single time i don't seem to be able to um you know kind of neuter myself on this but uh but hopefully i will because i think you're ultimately right um you know that that you know the intelligence professionals um you know don't go down that line of uh, uh, prediction because you're going to get caught you might get right but uh, mostly it's because you're going to get you're going to get lucky so Uh, This is the point in the podcast where we have to say goodbye to our guests who are not yet subscribers. If you want to listen to the rest of the podcast and to all of our other shows in full, just go to the dsrnetwork.com and click on membership. It's only $7 a month, and it brings you a lot of great bonus content. If you're not a subscriber, we hope you will be soon. And if you are one, stand by. Thank you for listening to Above Average Intelligence, hosted every week by Mark Polymeropoulos and David Rothkopf. Above Average Intelligence is a production of the DSR Network and was produced by Riley Fessler. 